I'm Jamie Wyver. I work on the RSPB magazine and the RSPB's weekly Notes on Nature email to supporters. Now, now it's summer and many of us have been to or will be heading to the coast, so it's a great time to celebrate seabirds. This webinar is going to explore several aspects of seabirds. We're going to look at some ID, how to identify them, what's it, what's it like watching them, and the challenges that affect the UK seabird colonies. Now, across our isles, we have a variety of seabird species, from the largest, the goose-sized gannet, to the tiniest, the storm petrel, which is almost as small as a sparrow. Then there are the popular puffins, their close relatives, the guillemots and razorbills, and more. And the British Isles is internationally important for seabirds. Over two thirds of the planet's gannets and 90% of its Manx shearwaters nest here. We're going to start today with some seabird ID uh, with Marine Policy Officer Samuel Robel. Samuel's going to also discuss some of the threats facing U UK seabirds. Laura Kodolska, Site Manager at RSPB South Stack, will talk us through the birds that nest at that wonderful nature reserve. Chantal McLeod Nolan, who's Project Officer for the Global Species Recovery Unit, will give us a brief guide to terns that we might see here in the UK and how we're helping them breed successfully here. And finally, Martin Noble of Sea Power reveals how seabirds and their habitats have inspired the rock band's music. As I say, as we go along, please do add your questions in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to answer them. First of all, we're going to start with a look at seabirds, a bit of ID with uh, Samuel Robel. So can we get Samuel and some seabirds, please? Samuel, hello. Good morning, Jamie. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? I'm well. I see you're floating above the sea there. That looks a bit choppy. I know, as always. I mean, you have to be on brand with, uh, with seabirds today, don't we? Absolutely. So we have got some seabirds to show you. So can we get the first slide up, please? Now, this is a fairly, a fairly obvious one, a popular one, isn't it, Samuel? It is. This is our kind of a lot of our poster, poster child of, of the seabird world. Everybody kind of loves, everybody wants to go and see the puffins. Um, so we thought we'd start around a lot of the orcs. Um, so not orcs like we get in Lord of the Rings, A-U-K-S, orcs. Um, puffins are one of this category. We'll go on to some of the other ones um, in a second here as well. But it's that iconic orange bill that we get here with the puffin as well, don't we, Jamie? It's just one of the most eye-catching eye catching bills in the seabird world almost. And we, we get them at their best because this, this is what they look like in summer, but in winter that kind of fades away, doesn't it? It does, yeah. So it's really interesting that they don't have this all year round. This colouring comes from the food that they eat, a lot of the pigments um, in, in the in the fish that they're eating as well. That's what gives them this colour and also that little florette around the, the, the corner of their bill there as well. So the juveniles won't have this over winter. The adults kind of lose it a little bit as well. And then they have to stack on heaps of food um, pre-breeding season in that early January to March time um, to really bring back that colour and show how well they are at catching food, how good they are at it and what, what a good mate they will be. And unlike a lot of the other birds that we're going to talk about this morning, this is not a cliff nesting species. This is a bird that goes into all rabbit burrows or somehow excavates its own, its own burrows for its chicks as well. Yeah, so a lot of our seabird colonies that we'll go to, like South Sack that we'll be talking about shortly as well, I mean, they're, they're huge environments, they're massive cliffs and they're full of seabirds. But they don't all nest on cliffs, as you were saying, Jamie. So puffins, they dig burrows um, so they can dig those with their feet. They've got incredibly sharp claws um, or even using that bill if they need to. But that, they tend to try and protect that as best they can. But they're very opportunistic. So if a rabbit somehow got onto the islands and starts digging burrows, these guys will use it from last year's season, potentially other seabirds. Um, so whatever kind of hole and little burrow they can find, they will be using that um, as best they can. Always nice to see a puffin. So I don't think we need to give you any ID tips for this one. This is hopefully a very, very easy one. There's nothing else in the UK that looks quite like it. Let's move on to the guillemot, um, which is this lovely sort of sleek black and white seabird. Yeah, so we've got guillemot and then we'll go on to razorbill shortly, which are kind of very similar on, on first approach looking. Um, as you can see, that bright white kind of whole front, that whole belly is very white. The guillemots are, they look black and white. They're a very soft kind of chocolate brown colour. You can see here this left one is giving that little bit of hint of that chocolate brown. Um, but they've got that really sharp pointed bill as well. Um, can be a little bit tricky between this one and the razor wheel that we'll go on to uh, in a moment. And often they can bunch together and they do bunch together in enormous colonies and you'll have thousands of these guys all lined up one by one along their cliffs 
they're fighting for space. They don't actually often make nests as well. The eggs are shaped very pointed at one end, so they shouldn't roll off, but they just nest on rock, um, which is always a bit of a precarious start. And these guys are really, really good parents as well. So the dads with the, with the guillemots and the razorbills as well, they will often, chicks will take flight and they'll just plummet into the water um, and, and the dads will take care of them for the next few weeks or so out at sea before they're ready to, to finally go off and find food themselves. Brilliant birds. Let's take a look at the razorbill, which as you say is fairly similar from a distance, but you can see it's a, a slightly different shape, isn't it? Yeah, so it's good to kind of talk about them together almost. So the razorbills, that bill is a lot chunky you can see the difference there from the guillemot it's a much bigger bill i like to think of these guys as like the silver fox of the, of the seabird world they're very sleek looking very smart um they do have when they open their mouth if you ever get lucky enough to to use some really good binoculars or through a scope or, or see pictures on the inside their mouth is bright yellow which is a real kind of shocking characteristic um but as you can see they are similar to those guillemots it can be difficult in flight, sometimes there are really good ways to distinguish between them. Um, Raisebills tend to have a little bit more white on their flanks behind their wings. Um, it just shows a little bit more um, as they're flying along. But also between all these three orcs that we're just talking about here, the, the way that they fly can be slightly different. So puffins are tiny. They're a lot smaller than you think they are, um, kind of often smaller than a pigeon size. They're very oval little block birds. So they're quite easy to di uh, distinguish between some of these other orcs. Then when we get to the guillemots and razorbills, it can be tricky. Razorbills generally are a much even body, so they're a lot more level and their wings are a lot flatter when they fly. When you look at a guillemot, they're back heavy, so they seem to be struggling to, to stay up almost with their kind of their bum dragging along in the air a little bit. So it's these little things that if you go out, go to one of our colonies, um, you can pick up and start spotting a few of them and start noticing that some of them are slightly different. And one that's really distinctive is, is this next one, the uh, the black guillemot, uh, known as the Tysty, I think, in some parts of the UK. What's distinctive about this, Samuel? It is, yeah. So the black guillemot is a lovely little bird. So they're mainly around Scotland and Northern Ireland. I mean, you get them around into the Republic of Ireland as well. Um, so kind of similar to that guillemot in terms of name. But other than that, that's about it. These guys are totally black, apart from that big white patch on their wing that you can see there. That's really distinguishable when they're in the water. They're a little black blob and they've just got this bright white patch on the side of them as well. But it's their feet with these ones. So their feet are bright red. Um, you'll see with the puffins when they come into land, they've got bright orange feet. Um, no other bird really has this kind of shocking red colour here as well. So. If you're in the south of the UK, around England, you're unlikely to see these guys unless it's winter time out to sea. But certainly around the Scot um, Scotland, west coast of Scotland, Northern Ireland and Republic, um, definitely look out for these ones. They're a real, real treat to see them, definitely. I've seen them bobbing around the harbour at Oban whilst waiting to get the ferry over to Mull. Um, yeah, delightful little birds. Now, the next one I think is one of your favourites, because uh, I know you've done a video on this for us before. This is the Fulmer. And I think you you told me before that they are the UK's like like a mini albatross, aren't they? They are, yeah. I've got a little soft spot for uh, for Fulmer. They are indeed our versions of the albatross. Um, I say that because they're part of the same family. So the tube noses. This is a really good picture of one here. You can see that big nostril on top of the bill. Um, so the fancy name for all of this is the Procellariforms, but no one can be bothered to say that word. Um, so the tube noses. So these are our albatrosses, our petrels, our shearwaters, and fulmers fall into that category as well. Um, they fly very similar to albatross, so it's a very straight wing pattern, big gliding movements. They'll go very low to the water, and they don't really need to flap that much as well, so they can really use that wind. They're a grey and white kind of bird. The easiest thing to distinguish them is that flight. If you kind of head out and you can start to see a few of the gulls flying around, a lot of flapping in this gliding pattern, the difference will be that straight wing of the fulmar not doing a lot of flapping. And that tube nose as well. Um, if you get lucky enough to, to get up close and can see one of those through, through some binoculars or scope, um, it is an amazing feat of natural engineering. So that enables them to get rid of salt from their diet. So they never really need to drink fresh water. They can take on salt water. They can take it through their diets. And then they've got like a little onboard desalination plant. So they can take out the salt from the water and then they just sneeze it out as they go along as well. So it means that they can continually recycle that water, um, which is just an amazing, amazing opportunity for them. 
That's an extraordinary bird. I've seen them uh, soaring around at RSPB Bempton Cliffs. And yeah, what a sight. And as you say, once you can pick them out and you see that distinctive kind of pattern of flying and the wings are kind of held, held stiff um, compared to some of the other birds flapping around, it's, it's, it's pretty clear which is the former. We're going to move on now to um, one which is often mistaken. So we see cormorants a lot across the UK. They're those big black water birds, long necks. You often see them in inland gravel pits, reservoirs, wings outstretched, drying. This is their, their cousin that you see more on the coast, isn't it? It is, yeah. So we've got the shags and the cormorants. They are tricky to distinguish between them. There are some little tips and some little things that you can pick up on. And as you're saying, Jamie, one of the easiest is location. Think where you are. If you're inland somewhere and you're seeing a bird that looks something like this, it's generally going to be that that cormorant. Um, shags are very much seen on our coastlines. Um, they're very much a seabird um, compared to those. They, in that sense, they are very good at swimming. Um, so you'll see these guys are actually all black. Um, so that black comes from the melanin in, in, in their feathers. It's really strong. They can go to some really great depths um, and they can spend a lot of time underwater. Um, so they are our, our true seabirds. They're not very good at flying. Um, which is kind of a kind of a funny characteristic you can see between them. But between the two, if we kind of go on to where we've got Cormoran and Shag next to each other. You can really, there's some subtle differences that you can you can pick out on that kind of head shape there is a little bit different. Um, so kind of where we have more more rounded head of the shag, it's a lot a little bit larger and more chunkier on the cormorant. Um, I would say in flight, you can sometimes tell as well. So one of the things we picked up on here, so this is from our website. So if you're not sure and you do want to check, just head to our website. There are some really useful ID tips there as well. Um, but in flight, the shag tends to have a narrow kind of straighter looking neck, whereas the cormorant is a little bit chunkier and the neck stays a little bit more kinked, um, a little bit more of a fold in it. Um, but there are some little tips like that. It does depend on the breeding season. So shags will have feathers that stick up and a little crest above their head, which is a really useful one. That's a really clear. Yeah, I'm, I'm a shag, I'm, I'm a cormorant, whatever it is. So there's these little bits that you can you can pick up on. And then you can see the cormorant has these colorations around the white patches around there their bill and their cheek area. So a lot more prominent, particularly when we come into the, into the breeding season. So we're still in the breeding season now. So it's a perfect time to kind of see these guys in full color um, and really get used to them when, where, when they're at their best. And then you can kind of apply those skills later on in the year as well. Thank you. Let's move on to the kitty wake. There's a lot to say about kitty wake. So this is, this is a, a member of the gull family. Um, I always think of it's got a kind of a bit of a softer, less harsh look than some of the, the you know, the, the herring gulls that you might see. Um, and I've seen and heard these in, uh, if you go to Newcastle, Gateshead at this time of year, on the Tyne Bridge, uh, along the, what's the art gallery there, that wonderful art gallery. So you have nesting really close, you can get really good views of them. The Baltic, that's it. Um, so, but these are, these are in trouble, aren't they, Samuel? They are, unfortunately. So like, like with many of our goals, really, I think a lot of our goals get a bit of a bad rep, um, but many of our goal species are declining, kittiwakes in particular. So they are now threatened globally with extinction. Um, so in the UK, they are on the red list of birds of conservation concern. And that is primarily down to food availability. Um, they feed on sand eels, tiny little silver fish, um, it's one of the common ones that you'll see in puffins bills as well, that characteristic photo of a puffin with fish in its bill. Those are sand eels. Kittiwakes use them as well. Loads of our seabirds rely on them, particularly in that North Sea. Um, we know that is the primary source of food for many of our seabirds. And unfortunately, due to things like climate change, overfishing, unsustainable fishing, we're losing our sand eels at a, an alarming rate and an unsustainable rate as well. It's showing in our kitty wakes. Our seabirds are like the, the canary in the coal mine. Um, they're not doing well. It shows that the whole ecosystem is struggling a little bit. So something that we've been calling on um, is a closure to industrial sand eel fishing in, in UK waters. So you may have seen our reaction earlier in the year for England to be closed. So we're hoping that that's going to be close to fishing. But also really important now as well is there is a, a, an action in Scotland to close Scottish waters to industrial sand eel fishing. So if you haven't already, I really, really urge you to go and sign that e-action. Um, it's absolutely vital that we do that. And you don't have to be in Scotland. I'm way down in the south of England and I've signed it. Um, but it will mean that whole UK join up that we're not fishing for the sand eels that our seabirds absolutely need. 
and we can put that link in, in we can show you that link now so if you want to take part and help us secure the future of some of these birds now the loss of sand eels um is just one problem that's facing our seabirds and we'll pick up on it on a few more during the session today um but let's just move on to a different species now so this is a much larger one this is the gannets and um the very distinctive goose sized bird um i think they're very distinctive in flight as well white with black tips to the wings what what else do we know about gannets yeah i mean as you say they're massive they're our biggest seabird uh, in the uk they do have this kind of orange yellowy tinge along the on the tops and in flight massive white bird black tips to those wings some of the youngsters are a little bit more black across the top but there's nothing you'll see that kind of um combats them on size at all they are enormous they have this huge bill um and that is perfect for entering the water at speed um these guys are divers so you'll see them fly up nice and high they'll tuck and plummet into the water hitting the water at kind of 60 70 miles an hour um, and there'll be an absolute arrowhead when they do that as well if you ever if you have a little quick google or a quick search after this for um for gannets diving you'll see that from the tip of their bill all the way to their tip of their wings is one line and um, they can really tuck in really tight so they are an incredibly uh incredible bird Let's look at this next picture because it's quite revealing. This and this relates to an issue that a lot of seabird colonies are suffering from at the moment, doesn't it? Yeah, so instantly you can see the eye is different. Um, those gannets we saw before have got this beautiful kind of light blue eye, not so much with this one. So this is we think, and we're we're constantly doing research into this this year and taking blood samples, but we think um it is due to them surviving avian flu or highly pathogenic avian influenza, bird flu, whatever you want to call it. Um, we think that gannets, some gannets are able to survive it. So the black eye, we don't know why the eye goes black yet, um, but it means that they have had it and they've pushed through it and they've come out the other side of it and they are still surviving. As far as we can tell, it doesn't seem to inhibit their foraging behavior and able to get food. Gannets are a visual hunter. They'll use their eyes, they'll use their eyesight, and they can still seem to be able to find enough food and survive off that. Um, but avian flu has been a massive impact on our already pressured seabirds. And I think that's the that's the real key thing here is our seabirds are under a lot of pressures. Um, and what we see now is an added pressure on that system. Avian flu has come in and really decimated a lot of our colonies. We saw a lot last year. We thought this year was going to be a little bit better, but it looks like it's it's coming back quite strong now as well, um, which is really, really tough to see, especially for some of our conservationists on the ground who have dedicated a lot of their lives to a lot of these colonies. And there's not a lot we can do specifically with avian flu at the moment. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. So I I'll, I'll just want to say briefly, Samuel, um, we're coming to the end of, the, of, the, of this sort of section of the, of the of the session today, but I know that your role deals with a lot a, a, another threat, doesn't it? If you could just tell us about the the other threat that you you're often dealing with in your in your role. Yeah, so I'm I am a marine policy officer, but I focus on offshore wind. Um, that is my role. So as I was saying, we've got these multitude of threats. These are what seabirds are face: climate change, overfishing, unsustainable fishing, invasive species on our islands. We've seen avian flu, but we have also got offshore wind development, um, which is a real tricky one to negotiate. We absolutely need renewable technology. Um, we've seen recently how important that is. Climate change is really affecting our seabirds. Um, you may have seen as well in the news, hopefully around the, the marine temperatures and the sea temperatures are increasing um, up by four or five degrees of water, which is an enormous amount. That's having massive knock on effects for our seabirds. What we don't want to see, though, is the combat to that climate change, that renewable energy, that that just adding another pressure because it can do the scale that we need offshore wind is like nothing we have ever seen before. Some of these turbines going out at sea are the height of the Shard in London, 300 metres, if not more. They can pose a threat. So what we're doing here is we're working with government, working with the developers of the wind farms, working with other NGOs and people like that to really make sure that it's done in a way that helps nature. It manages our seas better, it, it provides better habitat, it helps fund other areas, um, just to ensure that, yes, it combats climate change, but it doesn't hammer down the seabirds in the, in the process. Because the last thing we want here is mitigating climate change and hitting net zero, but we lose all our seabirds in the process. We need both. It is a nature and climate emergency. Can't do them separately. So it's those added pressures, it's a real battle. We're going to very, very quickly look at two last two seabirds, if you don't mind, uh, Lisa. I think we'll 
will skim past them because they they, they skim over the water. Um, Manx shearwater and storm petrels. So I wanted to show you these quickly. I, I don't know if we can get the sound working on this one, um, but they have a very distinctive noise. But this is a, a beautiful seabird. Um, quick summary of, of, of Manx shearwater, Samuel. Quick summary. Uh, one of the biggest migratory seabirds we get. So these guys will head from our west coast. So they're primarily down the west coast of, Eng of England and Wales. They will head all the way down to the South Africa, across around South America, all the way up the coast and back again in a huge figure of eight. Um, again, former very long straight wing, same family as the albatrosses and all of that. Glide very low to the water. And these are burrow nesters, again, like the puffins and the nocturnal. Absolutely beautiful. They're stunning, aren't they? And another, and the storm petrel is nocturnal as well. Let's have a quick look at that one. A tiny little bird, isn't it, Some. It is, yeah. So as you mentioned at the start, almost almost as big as a sparrow. And um, they're absolutely tiny. You'll get them out at sea. So if you're ever lucky enough to head out on a boat along that west coast, um, these are the ones to look out for. They're beautiful. So moving on quickly. So we're going to go and visit South Stack now in Wales with site manager Laura Podelska to see how the seabirds have been doing there. Over to you, Laura. Hello, uh, thanks for inviting me. I'll just share my presentation. It's really exciting to be able to talk about SouthStat today. Um, I've been working at SouthStat since 2014. And um, we are based in Wales. Um, we've got over 700 hectares of lowland coastal heathland. So the sort of heather and gorse you expect to see in the mountains is what you'll see when you come to SouthStat but it's hugged with a cliff line coast, which is where our seabirds live. And on this image, you can see a white building on the right hand side, which is Turelin, or Ellen's Tower. And on the left is the lighthouse. And it's in between this section here that our seabirds nest. The RSPB came to South Stack in 1977. So we've got decades of knowledge and data about how well the birds are doing here. And we rent a lot of the area from the local council. And it's got just about every designation you can imagine from geology through to um, birds. So we're based on the top left hand corner of Wales on an island called Anglesey, on a little island called Holy Island off Anglesey. Um, and uh, it's a yeah, really beautiful part of the world if you've never been. So it's just there on the top left. Lots of ferries go from Holyhead over to Ireland from us. So if you come to the reserve, um, it's split into two sections. We've got um, a Hollyhead mountain section and then a lower section that we call the range. Our main bulk of our seabirds is in the Hollyhead area and that's where we've got a visitor centre. We get up to 120,000 visitors to our visitor centre a year and probably about half a million across the reserve. So it's a really popular place for people as much as it is for wildlife. The purple shaded in areas are the areas that we manage. And you'll notice on the left hand side where there's an arrow pointed to South Stack Lighthouse. It's a little island that just juts off with the bridge going to it. It's not actually in our management, but we do count the seabirds that live along the cliff line there. So um, this is not a seabird. <laughs> this is Chuck. <clears throat> I've just popped it in because if you do come to see the seabirds at South Stack, you are likely to see these guys. And that's because they nest in sea caves along the cliff line at South Stack in amongst the seabirds. So they do, they're very sociable and they do go into flocks. So we have family units at this time of year. So we might have four or five. And then in the winter, we can have flocks of 30 going along the cliff line um, when you're looking out to sea. So what birds do we have at South Stack? Well, there are guillemots, um, which is the bird on the top left on here. And with the bulk of the seabirds that we've got are guillemots. There's about 13 and a half thousand of them. And they are, um, they nest in rows along the cliff line. And when you go from the visitor centre down, you get this incredible smell and sound in May and June from them all along the cliff line before you reach to see down where they all are in rows. It's an absolutely incredible experience to come here and see them. We've got uh, razorbills, which is the top right hand corner, about um, 1800 of those. They nest slightly higher than the guillemots along the, the cliff line. And thinking back to what we said earlier, these guys jump off the cliff, the, the chicks do, before they can fly. So when you do see them all the way stacked up on the ledges of the cliff, it's quite amazing to see the height that they come down from. We've also got puffins, but only about 10-ish. 
So uh, it's a bit of a where's Wally if you come to have a look at seabirds. There's 15,000, and in amongst them, there's about 10 puffins. We're in an unusual situation where um, lots of predators that would normally go into the burrows of puffins um, would force them onto islands where they don't live, like rats, cats, that sort of thing. But at Southstack, you can actually see them from the land here. But we've got such small numbers because of that extra um, influence that they get from predators. So they've just sort of dug burrows in amongst the rocks on the cliff line. And then we've got an array of other seabirds that we don't monitor as closely as um, the, the three at the top, which is the lesser black bat gull on the bottom left, the herring gull, which is also known as the chip stealing gull by many of our visitors that come, um, the greater black bat gull, which is such a massive gull when you see it um, going along the coastline looking for food. It can eat a puffin, a guillemot or a razorbill um, adult. So just to give you an understanding, this side is absolutely huge. And then on the bottom right there, I've got a, a photo of a fulmer that's actually nesting on an old raven's, chip, uh, raven's nest. So if you do come to the reserve and you want to see your seabirds, this is what the view you'll see when you come down from the visitor centre, that incredible sort of oily, fishy smell and sound of 15,000 birds chattering away. And on the ridges of the um, rock we've got here, we've got some of the oldest rock exposure in Britain. The guillemots have their nests, as we call them, but they're not nests in a traditional sense. They find a spot on a ledge where they'll lay an egg and then uh, mum and dad will take it in turns to look after that egg on the on the ledges. Ellen's Tower does have binoculars and scopes, so you can see them from there or ideally bring your own. There's always people around to point you in the right direction to find the puffins as well, which are often down the steps towards the lighthouse looking back. So question we get asked a lot is how do we know we've got 15,000 seabirds? So back in 1977, uh, the warden that used to work here took a photo of the cliff line where the birds were, separated up into sections where the geology made a distinct ridges, and then counted the birds in each of those sections. So if you can imagine our warden every year goes out and counts five times during June, so we can get an average number of the seabirds that we've got at the reserve, and she'll look at each of those areas and the guillemots she'll count up as best she can an attendance record. Because we don't know if the males or females are in or out. We class it as attendance rather than a nest because the males might come in with food to feed the females and stay for a little bit with them. So how are our seabirds doing at Southstack? Well, the guillemot numbers have done really well over the last 10 years. We've got lots more space on the cliffs. So there's more space for them to breed and for the youngsters from following years to come back. Our guillemots spend their wintering months in the Irish Sea. They start coming back in January, very small numbers, few hours, and then disappear if there's a storm for a week or two. By the time we get to April, we start to get thousands and thousands coming back in. But they don't overnight until the first eggs are laid. And that usually happens early May. And then they'll sit on the eggs until the chicks hatch in June. And then early July into the middle of July, we'd expect them to go back out to sea. And then we see them reappearing again in January. Our razorbill numbers have done a lot better in recent years. They were pretty steady. We're not really sure why we've had that increase in, in a more recent time, but they're doing really well at Southstack. Similar behaviour to a guillemot. We get numbers sort of, but there's such small numbers coming in at the late winter, early spring, but we'd expect to see them back in early May in big numbers. So our other seabirds, um, we do have a good number of herring gulls. Um, but you'll notice that they're all sort of flatlining or going down a little bit. Our puffin numbers haven't really changed in the last 10 years. And the fulmers and the kitty wakes, we only sort of count periodically when we've got the opportunity to do it. And their numbers, again, are sort of peaking and troughing at the reserve. Puffins go out to the Atlantic, so we don't tend to see them coming back until late April. So the best time to see them again is May and in June. So what do we do to help protect the seabirds at South Stack? Well, 15,000 seabirds is a lot of seabirds, but we're also one of the most popular places in Britain to come climbing, to do an activity called, called co-steering, where you walk along the top of the water, high tide line along the cliff edges, climb up onto ledges and jump in. And um, we also get lots of jet skis, lots of pleasure boat users. Anglesey is a really popular summer holiday destination with over 2 million visitors. So we get lots of people appearing with boats and doing lots of different activities and understanding what disturbance means to us and to the birds and trying to educate them. 
So if a bird flies away as a result of a human being on the water, they use that energy that they've been storing up to feed the chicks, and that's not helpful for the birds. So we want to try and do is minimise that happening and ask boats and pleasure users to slow down when they see flocks of birds resting on the water rather than going straight through them. And the way that we've done this over the years is by implementing agreements. Southstack was the first place in the UK to make an agreement with a climbing organisation called the BMC in the 80s. Um, Elvin, we were very fortunate back then, was working uh, for them and with us, and we put restrictions in during the bird breeding season. So we asked climbers who would normally climb on the right hand side of that cliff, it's, it's a really famous wall called Red Wall, um, to not climb up at the reserve during March, April, May, June, and then towards the end of July, we, we moved the restriction. And it's been amazing and it's worked really well for us and the climbers communicate greatly. At the moment, we're looking at doing a marine code with a local um, organisation called Snowdonia Active, working with um, our local government and with Elvin to do something very similar for the coast steerers because they go more into the caves where we got chop and things like that. So we're hoping to roll that out next year and it will again be an education programme, just asking people to think twice when they go into the areas where the birds are living. Kayaking, very popular around here, but often they picnic on the, the beaches. We've got seal pups. So again, it's just about educating what a seal pup needs and what disturbance to a seal pup looks like um, so that we can all enjoy the amazing wildlife at Southstack and it can live here happily. Thank you. <laughs> so I don't know if there's any questions or you want to leave it to the end. Thank you so much, Laura. I'm going to throw a quick question over to you now. Um, I think I think the answer, I think I know the answer, but Sarah has asked, when is the peak time to visit Southstack? Would you say June time? Yeah, yeah, June, definitely, because we've got all the little chicks poking their heads out under under the adults' wings and they're just, they're wonderful to see. Um, but you do really do need binoculars to be able to, to get close to them. Oh, lovely. Thank you so much. And I've been and I thoroughly recommend a visit. So if you, if anyone hasn't been, do go to South Stack and, and try and fit in a visit because it is a wonderful reserve. Thank you, Laura. We'll come back to you at the end if we've got any more questions. Okay. We're going to go over to Chantal now, who works with TURN. So we're going to look at a bit of TURN ID. Chantal. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm just setting up my slides. So hopefully you guys will be able to see this talk as well as hear it. So I'm assuming that it's all good. Come on. Joys of technology. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. But yeah, nice to meet you all. I'm Chantal, as Jamie said, and I work predominantly with seabirds, but uh, coastal uh, projects. So I will move on to what you're all here for, which is what terns do we have nesting in the UK and Ireland? So terns look a lot like small gulls. They are slender birds with long wings, and they basically are capable of making huge journeys, which I'll tell you a bit more about. But they're mostly white with a black cap, and as you can see, with either a red, orange, or a yellow bill. Um, but they're buoyant, they're graceful, and they've been given the nickname sea swallows, which is fantastic to watch. And because they, they're a seabird, you'll see them frequently hovering over the water and then plunging down to catch fish, which, as mentioned by, um, someone earlier, uh, sand eels is one of their preferred uh, food sources because it's really nutritious and it helps their chicks grow. Um, so they like to nest in groups, so you find them in colonies normally, they are noisy, they like to uh, protect themselves by nesting colonies, they can defend against predators, which unfortunately they do have a fair number, both avian as well as uh, mammalian. Um, but interestingly enough, um, they nest on um, the coast, which of course means that they don't really make a nest. So they actually make a scrape. So they kind of just make a slight hollow in the ground, like on sand and shingle areas, and then usually lay between one and three eggs. Um, they're a migratory species, so they actually arrive when spring uh, is coming to our doorstep, which was is very nice normally. So when you've got your swallows coming back, you've also got these kind of sea swallows, um, as we've given that nickname because of their agile flight. And they come from um, the west coasts and south coasts of Africa, some further further even, but they stay, nest here, raise their chicks, and then fledge, hopefully, some good numbers of chicks, and then head off in autumn back to their warmer, warmer weathers where we get the cold. So they're, they're pretty smart, to be honest. Um, they usually pair for life, but we're still learning more about that. Um, obviously, if they have a poor season, they might separate and might try and meet someone else. But it's, 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 it's not maintained, basically, this pairing uh, during the breeding season. So they reunite when they come back to the, the coasts here. So 
just to put this in perspective, um, these birds are, um, are all of birds of conservation concern. So four out of five of these are amber listed. One of them is red listed. And I'm, a, I'm, I'm sure some of you have heard about the highly pathogenic avian influenza, HPAI situation, which has been causing severe uh, seabird losses. Unfortunately, our nesting tern species have also been affected. However, we won't know the full impact until the on the population until after the breeding season ends and over the next several years. So I won't go into any detail about that now. So terns, and here are some uh, examples. So this is the common tern. So for those who are based more inland, you can find common terns at lakes, reservoirs across lowland Britain, um, especially around river valleys. And you can also find them on the coast. But if you're looking and you're based inland, common terns are your more likely species to see. Um, they are also one of the more adaptable tern species. So you might also find them nesting on platforms and rafts. And in the UK, you've got about 11,000 pairs breeding. Um, they're not that big. They're about 30, 35 centimeters um, in height. But yeah, no, they're uh, sorry, in height and in length. They're, they're lovely birds. And they have a very nice chirp noise. What's distinctive about them, as you may notice, is they've got a black tip to their red bill. They've got slightly longer red legs uh, compared to the Arctic tern, which I'll be showing you next. And they are uh, not as agile as the Arctic tern. And the Arctic tern is a very much marine coastal species. So although you will find common terns on the coast, your Arctic terns are the predominant ones there. So this is the Arctic tern. Um, as you can see, they've got shorter legs, they've got a really blood red bill, um, but they're also well known for being the true sea swallow, I guess, because they make a massive journey each year, some of them migrating all the way down to the Antarctic from the Arctic. So some of these birds, because uh, seabirds are quite long-lived, um, some of them which do live up to 25 years, they could be basically traveling to the moon and back, which is quite an impressive amount of miles for a small bird. Um, yeah, um, just to say their breeding population is about 54,000 pairs. Um, and as I mentioned, you can find them in, in the ice flow and they see the most daylight because of this massive migration they do. So it's, it's quite an impressive bird, but especially one for quite a small bird. And here is your sandwich tern, which is the largest of the tern species. You'll get them um, very distinctive in a way because they're, they've got the, this sort of big size compared to the others. They've got a black bill with a little yellow tip. Um, and what's really nice about them is they've got a short tail as well. So they've got a really like um, distinctive flight pattern. And again, most of these terms make this kind of trick noise, which is quite distinctive. Um, and apologies for my attempt to make myself sound like a turn. <laughs> but yeah, so they're based um, on basically a few sites across um, the UK and Ireland. They're large colony species again. Um, but you might also see them in the wintering ground in the wintering period because a small number, like 50, occasionally stay around the, the, the southern parts of the UK or even the Firth of Forth area. So yeah, you never know, you might see them. Maybe due to climate change, they're not traveling as far south anymore. But to put this in perspective, there's only about 14,000 pairs um, in breeding in the UK. Little terns, appropriately named because they are our littlest of terns. They are um, quite distinctive again because they've got that yellow beak and they've got this like little little like v, v white on their forehead, which is really really cute to see. Um, this this little bird is again. Um, I would say, again, found predominantly on the coast. They don't really like going inland, but if you go to other parts of the world, you'll actually find them inland. So this is quite an interesting thing with our little terns in the UK, that you, will you won't really see them inland. And they're also a bit more uh, susceptible to disturbance, um, which I will go into a bit more about, but this is the this uh, iconic species is known as the second rarest of the breeding, little ter uh, breeding terns, because you've only got about 1,450 uh, pairs. And they're small, they're about 22 centimeters. So yeah, they're, they're, um, they're not the, the biggest, as I said, um, but they are very much, uh, they've got quite a character. So if you're lucky enough to live near the coast and um, I would definitely recommend going and seeing them. Um, now, the roseate tern. I mentioned that some all of these birds are British conservation concern. Well, the roseate tern is the only one that is red listed. So they're very similar to the common tern and the Arctic tern, but they, they're a lot whiter. So they have they look a lot paler and they have a slight pinkish hue in the summer. And that black bill of theirs actually goes a little bit red closer to their mouth. 
and uh, they've got a very long tail streamer, so they just look delicate. Um, but as I mentioned, it's one of our rarest because it's red listed and it's it basically suffered a really severe decline. It, it, it went through a situation where in 19th century they were hunted because of this beautiful plumage I just mentioned and people would use them to decorate their hats. Luckily, legal conservation protected these species due to lots of advocating and as a result, the population recovered, but it, it still declined after predation issues and increased competition. So obviously, this is where we've been working hard to protect them. Um, unlike other tern species, they like to choose a nest under like little overhang vegetation areas or little crevices, which is why these nest boxes, as you'll see in the picture, have actually been really effective as protecting the species and providing suitable artificial habitat or like crevice like areas and that also helps them uh, from being affected by weather and you know also from predators so i won't go through this but just to say we had um two life projects focusing particularly on these rarer term species in the uk and ireland and the roseate one covered all of the uk and ireland and this is where we worked well together to try and protect these species um, we also have another project, um, um, which is called Life on the Edge, and they're also focused on restoring these um, coastal sites. So this is just to kind of give you a map of the area where the species, um, where we've worked, basically. Some of it's been direct delivery, some of it's been giving advice and working together. Again, these species don't really recognize borders, they don't recognize land. Um, so we've got lots of organizations and the RSV is just one of them. So I mentioned obviously lots of people working together. Well, that's not just um, just not that's not just paid staff. That's volunteers. So we've had you know beach nesting birds programs that we're trying to develop, which is to reduce disturbance and raise awareness to people about the birds that are nesting on the ground. So just to give them a bit of space and to share our coastline. Um, and the Little Term Project we've recruited more than sixty seasonal wardens, um, and this was during the five years of the project. But what was amazing was that the project had over 250 volunteers helping support that. You know, these motivated volunteers made such a difference in protecting, monitoring, raising awareness, and it's still continuing even though some of these projects have now ended. So just to say big thank you to all those amazing volunteers. What other things we've been up to? Well, we've been working on improving the situations at these sites, so creating more roseate turn terraces, um, you know, replacing hides for monitoring and night shifts, Putting up fencing that will reduce predation from foxes, for example, um, having the um, information for islands such as like biosecurity, so getting a better understanding of what animals might be coming onto the island. So here you've got these like uh, wax blocks that are like flavored. I think they like chocolate the best apparently, but I think it will depend on the type of animal coming forward. But having their little gnaw marks will tell us what's coming around and then we can kind of react appropriately. And obviously we're wanting to protect the species and share this information. So we've worked well with lots of different organizations to try and do this. One of the other th important things that we've been doing is as I said, improving the habitat. So this is a life on the edge as, uh, um, example. So this is where you've got an area in Essex in Hamford Water area. And this site was very important for little terns. It's the most important area for little terns in Essex. And, and you can see the small strip of vegetation, uh, you can see the small, small strip of um, sand and shingle area. And then you've got this massive amount of sand and shingle that's just been deposited all around it. And that's because due to climate change and coastal erosion, we're losing a lot of our habitat. And that's of course causing more problems for these coastal species. So by Putting up, uh, so this is a dredge material. So we use material that was being dredged from a river to make it easier for boats to get through. It was then deposited on the coast and then wave action is gently putting it onto the coast, which is obviously replacing the eroded area. So it's, it's a really nice way of making use of what materials are already being dredged out. And it's, it's also shown such a difference as well. So last year, um, no, sorry, two years ago uh, is when we did the project. So last year, we had 14 nests on the new habitat. So it just shows how important it is to do this sort of restoration work. And it also shows how quickly these birds will use the new habitat. And also it shows how resilient some of these birds can be. So it's a really nice example. And Life on the Edge is doing much more around the UK. So that was a whistle stop tour, but um, I'd just like to say thank you. And if you've got any questions, um, I think as Jamie said, there's something to talk about, a chance for me to talk a bit more later. Thank you.
Thank you, Chantal. And um, we did actually have a question about uh, link to life on the edge work. So um, I know you had it on the screen just now, but if you don't mind popping it over to our events team in the chat, we can share it publicly in the chat as well. Um, very quick question relating to your map slide, Chantal, before we move on to talking to Martin Noble. Um, Patricia wanted to know what the colour blobs represented, you know, when you were showing where all the colonies were. The, the, were the red ones the rosy tone colonies? What were the yellowish blobs? So actually, um, that uh, that was less to do with the species. Um, that was more to do with what we were doing. So red meant that's where oh. we were working with the funding that we were being given. We were able to improve yeah. those colonies specifically. Um, orange was kind of like we were giving advice, working with people who weren't in part of the the partnership but still sharing because obviously just because we haven't got the funding to work on that site doesn't mean we can't share what we're doing and they can share back um yellow is where we'd like to work in the future again this is where aspirations and blue is stuff where we pull together resources and then share it further so there's a thank there's you. an international aspect as well really helpful thank you so much Chantal really enjoyed that and we'll come back to you at the end if we've got time for any more questions I'm going to move over to uh, Martin Noble now, our special guest from the band Sea Power. Now, Martin, you are a fan of seabirds well, as well, I believe. Let's get Martin up on the screen. Ah, there you are. Hello, hi, Jamie. Oh, thank you so much for joining us. Now, you, you are a, right. you're a fan of seabirds. Now, in fact, you've got C in your band's name. So where did this all come from? Yeah, I mean, so I I studied zoology. Um, I'm sort of sort of fan of nature in general. Um, but yeah, we've we've got a song called "The Great Skewer." Um, so yeah, and we always sort of put bird noises in our in our music. Um, so we've got one song which, when it reaches a crescendo, there's loads of herring herring gulls there with like delay effects on them, and um, sort of adds to the the overall crescendo. And then some songs have got like woodland birds on that sort of help you relax, I think. Um, and yeah, I did a, a Radio 4 show with um, Guy Garvey from Elbow and, and Mark Riley, the DJ, and we went to the Shetland Isles um, and got to go over to Moosa Island, where we heard the um, storm petrels making this sort of very strange, churring, whirring noises. So I recorded those and put them onto a track as well kind of sound like a, a synthesizer. Yeah, I, I, I was just thinking about what you were saying about garden birds. So, so what we think of good garden birds and woodland birds and the research that has, done into, has been done into those about how they make us feel relaxed and it's a, yeah. you know, change. I mean, seabirds are slightly different, aren't they? They're not, to me, if I went to, um, you know, one of our thriving, bustling seabird colonies and heard that kind of beautiful cacophony. Yeah. I, I don't, I, is, is relaxing the word or is it something? No, I mean, <laughs> For the seabirds, definitely not. Um, yeah, we won't put those on for uh, the relaxation purposes. <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, they do. They do make a racket. So I'm, I'm down by the, the south coast, and we've got um, herring gulls all around us. Um, you might hear some herring gulls give you a sense of place, I suppose, don't they? When you hear the sound, and I've heard them used in music quite effectively. When you want to hear the sound of someone's talking about the sea or the beach, it's like it's usually that that cry that you hear. Yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing sort of the, the sounds that you hear of a of a location sort of yeah brings you to that space. And you're a birdie yourself. Do you is it you that brings the birding element to the band? Yeah, um I don't have to try and shoot it, horn it, chew on it in too much. They allow it, yeah. Um we have our own uh, festival um in the Lake District um uh, by Ravenglass, which is at the coast. Um but John Carter who's answering questions today. He comes along and we do a couple of RSPB based walks. So we get our fans involved in doing that. So, yeah, that's great. And have you had a chance to watch the seabirds this year so far? Yeah, um, well, say I, I live in just outside of Brighton. Um, so we've got in, in a place called Saltdean and there's about a mile of kind of wild cliff there. Um, so we pop down quite a lot. There's nesting peregrines. There's, we get four miles down there ravens um at, at turns occasionally um oyster catchers uh, yeah it's kind of a lovely little spot uh, not many people know about it i mean brighton's just a, a shingle beach um mm. so we did have a, a guillemot get washed up once me and my wife um, just saw it on the beach and yeah. <laughs> took it to the local wildlife rescue place did, did it recover was it okay 
Uh, as far as I know, yeah, yeah. Yeah, me, me and my wife um, tend to base our holidays around going to um, bird watching. So we've been to the Scilly Isles and the Outer Hebrides, um, like Benson Cliffs and the Farn Islands. So, yeah, we, we like to do it as much as possible. To go back to using um, seabird sounds in in your music, do you mm. go out and record them, or do you do you get hold of the, the sounds a different way? It's a bit of both, yeah. Um, so obviously, herringles are, are very easy for me to record, um, and I've got a friend actually who's um, been doing sound recordings of store of uh, Manx shearwaters. Um, so he's been going over there, and they've got very weird sounds. I don't quite know what music I'm going to put that into, but yeah, they sound like. They sound like witches, aren't they, or ghosts? <laughs> we can try. We can try and play that sound now. I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to ask Lisa if she can dig out the uh, the presentation that we had um, early with Sam because we did we did try and put an audio sound on it. And if it doesn't if it doesn't work, we'll send we'll send viewers to our website later. Yeah, but Lisa, if you get a minute while while Martin and I are chatting, see if you can get that slide up of the Manx Shearwater, which is the second to the end, and see if we can, we can play that sound because it's it's an eerie noise that people would hear at night, I suppose, when the, the birds are returning to their to their burrows. So quite a, quite a haunting sound. Yeah, yeah. Did did people think there used to be like ghosts or something like Witches that? or something? Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely extraordinary. Uh, yeah, Lisa, let's let's see if we can play that that sound now. Uh, I'm just going to have a listen and a look. We can invite Chantelle back with her bird impressions. <laughs> no, we're going to get, we're going to, we've got the slide. We, we, we're just going to go over to the mic. Right, let's try the sound. <laughs> Extraordinary. But you can see how that would inspire, inspire music. Um, thank you so much for that, Martin. And do stick around because we might come back to you at the end. Yeah. Um, but we've got we've had a lot of questions that have come in. Um, so one of them was about gulls. So just before the session started, Alison wrote to us to say, uh, can you help me with some gull ideas? So I'm going to invite in um, John Carter now, who's going to help me a little bit with identifying gulls. Um, and Lisa, do you have the gull um, PowerPoint presentation? Because we've got a few slides. Thanks, Claire. So so. Alison said she she sees um, herring gulls, great blackback gulls, and lesser blackback gulls regularly where she is. But it's identifying them in flight that's tricky. So we can see that there's one walking along here, herring gull. Yeah, fairly simple, um, basic. So John, can you talk a little bit about this. We've got this shot, and then we've got a shot of it in flight. Yeah, I mean, um, with with herring gull and lesser blackback, they're very similar size. So um, it's about that that mantle colour. On the on the photograph here, you can see it's kind of quite a pale grey. This herring gull. Whereas on a lesser blackback gull, it's really quite dark, very dark kind of grey, slate grey. Now, obviously, from underneath, that's not always easy to see. So they're actually quite similar underneath. I mean, the herring gull has pink legs and the lesser blackback has yellow legs. So if you can see that, that's quite an easy way of telling them apart. But as you can see in that photograph there, when the wing bends down in flight, you can see the upper wing. So as long as you keep your eye on the upper wing, you should be able to tell them apart fairly well. It's, it's, it's a, quite a big difference between the two colours of grey. So let's go to the, we've got a lesson about Venice. So you can see that's now a more slaty, darker grey. You've got those yeah. yellow legs. So, I, I mean, we're saying all this, but it probably helps if you had them all <laughs> conveniently lined up, fly together. But it is darker. <laughs> it's a lot darker, isn't it? It is, yeah. And uh, I mean, they vary. I mean, they, they, they go from that colour to almost black, actually. I mean, depending on the, there's this kind of, you know, different races of black, uh, of lesser black black gulls, which are kind of darker in the in the colouring. But generally, that's, um, yeah, that's a pretty good indicator of a, of a, a typical lesser black black gull there. And then final final slide here is uh, we've got a greater blackback. So this is huge. So I was looking this up at it. It's it, it sort of wingspan comparable with a buzzard. It's the largest gull in the world, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely massive. I mean, these things at distance, they almost look like ospreys flying in, you know, the huge things. And uh, and again, the black is on the on the upper mantle is really, really very dark. And they've got a kind of a pinkish kind of coloured leg as well. But it's this size. They're just enormous. And if you see one, uh, it's, it kind of takes your breath away, really. They are huge. Thank you so much, John. Now I'm going to um, just have a quick look through the, the other questions. We've had a lot of questions about avian flu, as you might imagine. Um, and as I think uh, Chantal mentioned earlier, we know that it's hit several seabird colonies, especially turns this year pretty badly. And we will share um, any stats that we have, any news that we have once we've rounded up sort of at the end of the breeding season and we can see the, the picture a bit more clearly. Um, 
I think we've answered a lot of questions in the chat about um, on offshore wind and sand eels, uh, which Sam has been talking about. Um, I'm going to have a very quick um, round up from all the speakers now, all the contributors, because I'm going to say it's now beginning of August. We've got a few weeks left of summer. Um, I want to know from everybody, what's the one seabird they would recommend that our viewers go out and look for? So I'm going to come to you, Martin, first. What, what should people go and look for? Um, I really love watching the Manx Shearwaters just gliding over the surface of the sea. It's amazing. So we saw a shot of that though, they're beautiful birds. Laura, what, what would you say people should go and see? I love the guillemots. <laughs> I'm a massive fan of the guillemots. They're just um, such gentle birds when you watch them in the colonies. They're so sociable. And um, yeah, they're just amazing and looking after the young at this time of year. So yeah, go and see a guillemot. Yeah, and ideally at one of our wonderful seabird colony uh, nature reserves like South Stack. Uh, Chantal, I think you're going to pick a turn, aren't you? But which one? Oh, difficult choice. Um, I'm going to have to go with Arctic turn. I mean, seriously, that's a bird that goes from the Arctic to the Antarctic. So go out and check out a bird that a looks like a sea swallow, has a beautiful agile flight when it plunge divers and then comes back out with a fish, but then also does that whopping journey and sees the most daylight of any animal, I believe. So good on it. There are so many fascinating facts about Arctic turn. It's, yeah, so it's, I think it's the, world, it's the biggest migration in the world. It's the longest migration. Truly amazing bird. John, I'm going to come back to you for a second. What seabird would you suggest people go and see? Um, I think um, you know, as we're heading to autumn, the seabirds on the move, so head to the coast. I mean, yeah, sheer waters are great in the autumn. You see them offshore in huge numbers flying low over the water. Absolutely fantastic. Two votes for the sheer water. Samuel, finally, over to you. Oh, no surprise. Got to be the former. You have to just go see them. Great flyers. And yeah, they, they're always forgotten about as they look a bit like a gull. But yeah, one of my faves. Yeah, extraordinary little mini, mini albatrosses. So um, we are running out of time. I'd like to say a massive thank you to all our speakers and our contributors, Samuel, Laura, Chantal and Martin, plus Lisa, Hayley, Claire and John, who've helped out behind the scenes. And thank you all for watching everyone who's been part of our webinar today. Um, if you'd like to make a donation towards some of our work, um, when you can see a whole range of it in the talks we've done today, looking after turns, um, fighting for you know, a sand eel fisheries, um, trying to make sure that birds have got food and spaces to live, um, researching avian food. There's so much we're doing at the moment to try and look after seabirds. Um, we'll put a link up on the screen now. Uh, there's a link in the chat and there's a QR code if you're double screening with your smartphone. Um, and that'd be great if you're able to make a donation. Now, as this webinar finishes, a survey will pop up on your screen. It'll only take you a few minutes to complete and it will really help us plan future events for you. Again, thank you all so much and we hope to see you at our next webinar. Thank you.